Chapter Six, Part One of Gigolo by Edna Ferber. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ain't nature wonderful? Part One. When a child grows to boyhood and a boy to manhood under the soul-searing blight of a given name like Florian, one of two things must follow. He will degenerate into a weakling crushed beneath the inevitable diminutive flossy, or he will build up painfully inch by inch a barrier against the name's corroding action. He will boast of his biceps, flexing them the while. He will brag about cold baths. He will prate of chest measurements, regard golf with contempt, and speak of the West as God's country. Florian Sykes was five feet three and a half, and he liked to quote those red-blooded virile poems about the big open spaces out where the West begins. The biggest open space in his experience was Madison Square, New York, and Eighth Avenue spelled the Far West for him. When Florian spoke or thought of great heights, it was never in terms of nature, such as mountains, but in artificial ones like skyscrapers. Yet his job depended on what he called the great outdoors. The call of the wild, by the time it had filtered into his city abode, was only a feeble cheep. But he answered it daily, from his rooms to the store in the morning, from the store to his rooms in the evening. It must have been fully ten blocks each way. There are twenty New York blocks to the mile. He threw out his legs a good deal when he walked, and came down with his feet rather flat, and he stooped ever so little with the easy slouch that came in with the one-button sack suit. It's the walk you see used by English actors of the what-what school, who came over here to play gentlemanly juveniles. Down at Inverness and Heath's, they called him nature's rival, but that was mostly jealousy, with a strong dash of resentment. Two of the men in his department had been main guides, and another boasted that he knew the Rockies as he knew the palm of his hand. But Florian, whose trail finding had all been done in the subway shuttle, and who thought that butter sauce with parsley was a trout's natural element, had been promoted above their heads half a dozen times, until now he lorded it over the fifth floor. Not one of you, unless bedridden from birth, but has felt the influence of the firm of Inverness and Heath. You may never have seen the great establishment itself, rising story on story just off New York's main shopping thoroughfare. But you have felt the call of their catalogue. Surely, at one time or another, they have supplied you with tents or talcum, with sleeping bags or skis or skates, with rubber boots or resin or wheels. On their fourth floor, you can be hatted for Palm Beach or booted for Skagway. On the third, outfitted for Samaritz or San Antonio. But the fifth floor is the pride of the store. There is the camper's dream realized. There you will find man's most ingenious devices for softening Mother Nature's flinty bosom. Mosquito-proof tents pails that will not leak, fleece-lined sleeping bags, cooking outfits made up of pots and pans of every size, each shaped to disappear mysteriously into the next, like a conjurer's outfit, the whole swallowed up by a magic leather case. Here Florian reigned. 
if you were a regular Inverness and Heath customer, you learned to ask for him as soon as the elevator tossed you up to his domain. He met you with what is known in the business efficiency guides as the strong personality greeting. It consisted in clasping your hand with a grip that drove your ring into your bone, looking you straight in the eye, registering alert magnetic force, and pronouncing your name very distinctly. Like this. Hand clasp firm, straight in the eye. How do you do, Mr. Outertown? Haven't seen you since last June. How was the trip? He didn't mean to be a liar, and yet he lied daily and magnificently for years to the world and to himself. When, for example, in the course of purchasing rods, flies, tents, canoes, saddles, boots, or sleeping bags of him, you spoke of the delights of your contemplated vacation, he would say, that's the life. I'm a Western man myself. God's country. He said it with a deep breath and an exhalation, as one who pants to be free of the city's noisome fumes. You felt he must have been born with an equipment of chaps, quirts, spurs, and sombrero. You see him flinging himself on a horse and clattering off with a flirt on hoofs, as they do it in the movies. His very manner sketched in a background of plains, mountains, six-shooters, and cacti. The truth of it was that Florian Sykes had been born in Kenosha, Wisconsin. At the age of three, he had been brought to New York by a pair of inexpert and migratory parents. Their reasons for migrating need not concern us. They must indeed have been bad reasons. For Florian, at thirteen, a spindle-legged errand boy in oversized knickers, a cold sore on his lip, and shoes chronically in need of resoling had started to work for the great sporting goods store of Inverness and Heath. Now, at twenty-nine, he was head of the fifth floor. The cold sore had vanished permanently under a regime of health food, dumbbells, and icy plunges. The shoes were bench-made and flawless. If the legs still were somewhat spindling, their correctly creased casings hid the fact. There's little doubt that if Florian had been named Bill, and if the calves of his legs had bulged, and if, in his youth, he had gone to work for a wholesale grocer, he would never have forged for himself a coat of mail whose links were pretense and whose bolts were sham. He probably would have been frankly content with the sight of an occasional ball game out at the polo grounds, and the newspaper bulletins of a prize fight by rounds. But here he was at the base that supplied America's outdoor equipment. He, who outfitted mountaineers, must speak knowingly of glaciers, chasms, crevices, and peaks. He, who advised canoeists must assume wisdom of paddles, rapids, currents, and portages. He, whose sleeping hours were spangled with the clang of the streetcars, must counsel such hardy ones as were preparing to seek rest cheerfully rolled in blankets before a campfire's dying embers. And so, slowly, year by year, in his rise from errand to stock boy, from stock boy to clerk, from clerk to assistant manager, thence to his present official position, he had built about himself a tissue of innocent lies. He actually believed them himself. Sometimes a customer who in June had come in to purchase his vacation supplies with the city pallor upon him, returned in September, brown, hard, energized, to thank Florian for the comfort of the outfit supplied him. 
"'I just want to tell you, Sykes, that that was a great little outfit you sold me. Yes, sir, not a thing too much, and not a thing too little either. Remember how I kicked about that air mattress? Well, say, it saved my life. I slept like a baby every night, and the trip. You've been there, haven't you?' Florian would smile and nod his head. His grateful customer would clap him on the shoulder. Some pebble, that mountain. Get to the top, Florian would ask. Well, we didn't do the peak. That is not right to the top. Started to a couple times, but the girls got tired, and we didn't want to leave them alone. Pretty stiff climb, let me tell you, young feller. You should have made it to the top. Been up, have you? A dozen times. Oh, well, that's your business, you might say. Next time, maybe we'll do it. The missus says she wants to go back there every year. Florian would shake his head. Oh, you don't want to do that. Have you been out to Glacier? Have you done the Yellowstone on horseback? Ever been down the Grand Canyon? Why, no, but you've got a few thrills coming to you, then. The sunburned traveler would flush mahogany. That's all right for you to say, but I'm no chamois. But it was a great trip just the same. I want to thank you. Then, for example, Florian's clothes. He had adopted that careful looseness, that ease of fit, that skillful sloppiness, which is the last word in masculine sartorial smartness. In talking, he dropped his final G's and said sportin' and mountain climbin' and shootin'. From June until September, he wore those Norfolk things with bow ties, and his shirt patterns were restrained to the point of austerity. A signet ring with a large scrolled monogram on the third finger of his right hand was his only ornament, and he had worn a wristwatch long before the war. He had never seen a mountain. The ocean meant Coney Island. He breakfasted at Child's. He spent two hours over the Sunday papers. He was a tittle-bat titmouse without the whiskers, and... Myra loved him. If Florian had not pretended to be something he wasn't, and if he had not professed an enthusiastic knowledge of things of which he was ignorant, he would, in the natural course of events, have loved Myra quickly in return. In fact, he would have admitted that he had loved her first and desperately, and there would have been no story entitled Ain't Nature Wonderful. Myra worked in the women's and misses, third floor, and she didn't care a thing about the big outdoors or the great open spaces. She didn't even pretend to at first. A clear-eyed, white-throated, capable young woman, almost poignantly pretty, you sensed it was the kind of loveliness that fades a bit with marriage. In its place come two sturdy babies to carry on the torch of beauty. You sensed, too, that Myra would keep their noses wiped, their knees scrubbed, and their buttons buttoned, and that between a fresh blouse for herself and fresh rompers for them, the blouse would always lose. She hated discomfort, did Myra, as does one who has always had too much of it. After you have stood all day from 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. selling sweaters, riding togs, golf clothes, trotteur to athletic Dianas, whose lines are more lathe than lithe, you can't work up much enthusiasm about exercising for the pure joy of it. Myra had never used a tennis racket in her life, but daily she outfitted for the sport-bronzed young ladies who packed a nasty backhand wallop in their right. 
she wore and was justly proud of a four a shoe and took a good deal of comfort in the fact that as she sold seven c's at twenty two dollars and fifty cents a pair to behemoth damsels who possessed money in proportion to myra's beauty myra was the only girl in her section who never tried to dress in imitation of the moneyed ones whom they served the other girls were wont to wear severely tailored shirts mannish ties stocks flat-heeled shoes rough tweed skirts not so myra that delicate cup-like hollow at the base of her white throat was fittingly framed in a ruffle of frilly georgette she did her hair in soft undulations that flowed away from forehead and temple and she powdered her nose a hundred times a day her little shoes were high-heeled and her hands were miraculously white and if you prefer rosalind to viola you'd better quit her now anybody who wants to wear those cross-country clothes is welcome to them she said i'm a girl and i'm satisfied to be i don't see why i should wear a hard-boiled shirt and a necktie any more than a man should wear a pink georgette trimmed with feeling by the end of the week when i've spent six solid days selling men's clothes to women i feel as if i'd die happy if i could take a milk bath and put on white satin and pearls and a train six yards long from the shoulders you know not the least of myra's charm was a certain unexpected and pleasing humour it was as though on opening a chocolate box you were to find it contained caviar of course by now you know that myra is the girl you used to see smiling out at you from the inverness and heath catalogue entitled sports women's apparel the head of her department had soon discovered that myra posing for illustrations to be used in the spring booklet raised that pamphlet's selling power about a hundred per cent sunburned misses with wind-ravaged complexions gazing at the picture of myra cool slim luscious looking saw themselves as they would fain be and bought the knollwood sweater depicted in silk or wool putty maize navy rose copen or white thirty five dollars myra posed in paddock coat and breeches she who had never been nearer a horse than the distance between sidewalk and road she smiled at you over her shoulder radiant in a white trico palm beach suit who thought palms grew in jardinière only on page seventeen she was revealed in the boyish impudence of our aiken polo habit complete ninety dollars she was ravishing in her golf clothes her small feet in sturdy flat-heeled boots planted far apart and only the most carping would have commented on the utter impossibility of her stance then there was the killy cranky travel tog background of assorted mountains made of scotch tweed she would never come nearer scotland than oatmeal for breakfast only one hundred and forty dollars to say nothing of motor clothes woodland suits trap shooting costumes yellowstone park outfits hunting habits she wore brogues and boots and skating shoes and puttees and tennis ties sou'westers leather top coats jersey silks military capes you saw her fishing hunting boating riding golfing snowshoeing swimming she was equally lovely in khaki with woolen stockings or in a habit of white linen and the shiniest of riding boots and as she peeled off the one to put on the next she remarked wearily a kimono and felt a slippers and my hair down my back will look pretty good to me to-night after this you see myra and florian really had so much in common that 
if he had been honest with himself the course of their love would have run too smooth to be true but florian in his effort to register as a two-fisted hard-riding nature-taming male made such a success of it that for a long time he deceived even myra who loved him and during that time she too lied in her frantic effort to match her step with his when he talked of riding and swimming of long hard mountain hikes of impenetrable woods she looked at him with sparkling eyes she didn't need to throw much effort into that nature having supplied her with the ground materials when on their rare sundays together he suggested a long tramp up the palisades she agreed enthusiastically though she hated it not only that she went loathing it the stones hurt her feet her slender ankles ached the sun burned her delicate skin the wind pierced her thin coat florian strode along with the exaggerated step of the short man who bitterly resents his lack of stature every now and then he stood still and breathed deeply and said glorious and myra looked at his straight back and his clear-cut profile and his well-dressed legs and said isn't it and wished he would kiss her but he never did in between times he bemoaned his miserable two weeks vacation which made impossible the sort of thing he said he craved a long hard rough trip into a mountain interior the rockies preferably in their jaggedest portions that's the kind of thing that makes a fellow over roughing it you forget about the city in the saddle all day nothing but sky and mountains god's big open spaces that's the life myra trudged along painfully but isn't it awfully uncomfortable you know cold and tense i don't think i'd like i wouldn't give a cent for a person who was so soft they couldn't stand roughing it a little that's the trouble with you easterners soft no red blood too many street cars and high buildings and restaurants chop down a few trees fry your own bacon and make your own camp and saddle your own horses that's what i call living i'm going back to it some day see if i don't myra looked down at her own delicate wrists with the blue veins so exquisitely etched against the white flesh a little look of terror and hopelessness came into her eyes i i couldn't chop down a tree she said she was panting a little in keeping up with him for he was walking very fast i'd be afraid to saddle a horse you have to stand right next to them don't you most girls can't chop florian smiled a little superior smile miss jessie heath can myra looked up at him quickly she's a wonder she was in yesterday he went on spent all of two hours up in my department looking things over there's nothing she can't do she won a blue ribbon at the horse show in february saddle she's climbed every peak that amounts to anything in europe did the alps when she was a little girl this summer she's going to do the rockies because things are so mussed up in europe she says i'm selecting the outfit for the party gad what a trip he sighed deeply myra was silent she was not ungenerous toward women as are so many pretty girls but she was human after all and she did love this florian and jessie heath was old man heath's daughter whenever she came into the store she created a little furore among the clerks myra could not resist a tiny flash of claws she's flat like a man and she wears seven and a half c 
and her face looks as if it had been rubbed with a scouring brick. "'She's a goddess,' said Florian, striding along. Myra laughed, a little high, hysterical laugh. Then she bit her lip, and then she was silent for a long time. He was silent, too, until suddenly he heard a little sound that made him turn quickly to look at her stumbling along at his side. And she was crying. "'Why, what's the matter? What's—' "'I'm tired,' sobbed Myra, and sank into a little limp heap on a convenient rock. "'I'm tired. I want to go home.' "'Why, he was plainly bewildered. Why didn't you tell me you were tired?' "'I'm telling you now.' They took the nearest ferry across the river and the subway home. At the entrance to the noisy, crowded flat in which she lived— my return to face him. She was through with pretense. She was tired of make-believe. She felt a certain relief in the thought of what she had to say. She faced him squarely. I've lived in the city all my life, and I'm crazy about it. I love it. I like to walk in the park a little, maybe, Sundays. But I hate tramping like we did this afternoon, and you might as well know it. I wouldn't chop down a tree, not if I was freezing to death. And I hate to have to sleep in a tent, so there. I hate sunburn, and freckles, and ants in pie, and blisters on my feet, and getting wet, and flat-heeled shoes. And I never saddled a horse. I'd be afraid to, and what's more, I don't believe you do either. Don't believe I do what? "'asked Florian in a stunned kind of voice. "'But Myra had turned and left him. "'And as he stood there, aghast, bewildered, resentful, "'clear and fair in the back of his mind "'against all the turmoil of thoughts that seethed there, "'was the picture of her white, slim, exquisite throat, "'with that delicate pulse beating in it "'as she cried out her rebellion.' He wished, or someone inside him that he could not control, wished that he could put his fingers there on her throat gently. End of chapter 6, part 1